Hey everybody, I hope you all had a good break. I just had four shots of espresso so and, and a cookie, so I hope you all are as uh, powered up as I am to talk about the future of Stack Overflow. So just over 14 years ago, Stack Overflow launched with a singular mission. And here's what it looked like in case you don't remember or you weren't around when it happened. <clears throat> Stack Overflow original goal was to build the library of programming knowledge. We had, the community had clear answers as to what this meant. A library of collective technical knowledge. Contributors, people answering and then editing the content to make it as reusable as possible. The users were passive by design and they were reading and then using the answers. The interaction was asynchronous and transactional and this was by design in order to have as wide of a scale of impact as we possibly could have. And the content was narrow, also by design, question and answers in written form. <clears throat> so what's changed? Um, well, what's changed in the world? What's changed in the big picture in the last 14 years? You can say a lot, but there's a couple specific things that I want to call out, right? Um, there's lots of new content types that we used to learn. Uh, videos, blogs, podcasts, you name it. Um, in addition to an explosion of content that's out there happening on the web that you're trying to just figure out what even to use to learn. We've seen an increased number of technologies that we all have to be knowledgeable or at least familiar with, and the pace at which they're changing is faster than ever. And we've seen an increased number of people, not only in technology roles, but also adjacent to technology, leveraging, gluing together pieces of technology, writing little scripts to glue them together to do their day job that would not call themselves a technologist. Some things are inherent and are unchanging. We want to be part of a community. Technologists appreciate others sharing their knowledge and want to share in return. Stack Overflow has become an inherent part of the developer and the technologist experience. How we learn still starts with a question. We want to make the most efficient use of our time. We all have way too much to do and not enough time to do it, so we're all thinking about how we can be more productive and more efficient. And we want to be included in a community. And in order to be, have an inclusive community, it can't be an afterthought. It has to be foundational and by design. So we're updating our goal because we've learned a lot since then. So first, let's touch on some individual learning insights that we've had. <clears throat> Individuals face many challenges. We did a lot of research. Uh, really focusing on what the most important and the most difficult uh, problems were that technologists are facing in learning journeys. What I think is really interesting, if you look at this, the most repetitive words you see are find and figure out, right? Find a resource, find time, find a course, find an expert to trust, or figure out, figure out where to start, figure out where to go next. And so what we found is that before you even get to the actual learning part, there's a lot of challenges that we face. So we see that there's three main modes of learning. The first one, learning by consuming, is probably what you would consider the most obvious, right? Taking a course, reading a book, reading a blog. Um, but what's really interesting is that learning by creating or building actually may be the most popular with technologists, right? I always say when I hire in technology, in addition to a few core skills, I look for attitude and for aptitude. And so how I try and measure aptitude is I ask folks, what's the last big thing you learned and how did you go about it? What I'm really looking for is a desire to learn and a self-awareness about how they learn best more than like the specific story of it. Um, but almost, I would say 80 plus percent of folks in technology, when I ask them, they say, I'm a hands-on learner. 
I don't offer that up. That's how they, that's how they self-identify. That's how they think of it. And so we know that it's important to have learning by doing or hands-on learning. And third, we have learning by sharing. Learning by sharing means communicating what you believe you understood. And I think it has twofold here. The first one is, as you're learning, you often want to interact with your peers. You want to share what you believe you have learned and what you believe you've understood to both refine it and to validate that you actually got the right things out of the content that you consumed or by doing the exercise. But additionally, as an expert, I've always said that you never learn something so well as when you teach it to someone else. I was an adjunct professor for a while, and I never understood my domain quite so well as when I had to teach it to a large group of people with varying levels of experience, with varying levels of knowledge, and different mental models from my own, and I had to figure out how to get this to them. So, what was really interesting in our research is when we asked this question, 77% of people said they often or always use many resources, not a few, not more than one, many. That was the exact term that they chose in order to solve a problem. And so we understand that it takes more that it's not finding just the answer, it's finding multiple pieces and then having to glue it all together often on your own to actually get the solution to your specific challenge or problem. But determining which resource to use is a pain point. So where to get started, right? How do I even know where to get started? Getting started is often in just about any journey, the hardest part, right? And with the number of uh, people we need in technology and the number of technologists out there, we need to make getting started easier and less intimidating. Technologists have to articulate their problem. So what's really interesting here is we said, it takes me several keyword searches to ask the right question. So you've got to get the question right, right? And I think it's really interesting that how much time, before you even start digging into the resources and everything else, how much time you end up spending just trying to actually get the question or the search terms right to even know where to get started. Articulating a technical problem is a skill. So I thought this was really interesting, what we found through our research. And when I read this, I was like, well, of course it is. But I don't think it ever actually heard it actually expressed this way. I don't think anyone would disagree with this. But it was like uh, Jody and I were, were looking at this and it was like, well, yeah, but we should talk about this more. You know, it's interesting on Stack Overflow, we talk about trying to educate new users on how to ask a good question. And sometimes it can feel like we're trying to limit people from interacting. But when we're trying to go for knowledge reusability, Asking a great question, the reason we educate people on how and why to ask a great question is you're more likely to get the answer you need. The better written your question is, the better able you're able to ar articulate your problem, the more likely you are to more quickly get what you need. But how can we help educate technologists, especially those newer in the field, how to get there faster? how to teach them how to articulate their problem, how to teach them how to ask a great question. And I think what's really interesting in this data is in the zero to five years experience, you see about 50-50, how confident they feel. What's interesting is six years and above, it sort of flat lines at about two thirds. And I think that has to do with the fact that we're constantly learning new technologies. And we're also learning the new vocabularies that go along with that technology so that we can feel confident articulating our problem or asking a good question. We know that an individual's learning journey has many steps before they get started. So take all the learnings I just told you and we put it into one slide to help you understand this. So first, you've got to understand and clearly identify what are you trying to do what do you need to know? What do you need to learn and understand? 
Then you need to figure out how to approach that goal. What are the set of things I know? What are the set of things I don't know to get there? Okay, then you've got to figure out how to discover through search terms and everything else and then evaluate from this monstrosity of content out there on the web, where should I spend my time? Who do I trust, right? What do other people recommend? And what's recent, right? Six months old in tech could be completely outdated and not worth your time, depending on where you are. That's all before you get to the learning. Then, one challenge we hear a lot is how do we carve out time and prioritize learning, right? How do we make that time? Then we consume a chunk of knowledge, and then we've got to apply it, whether that's applying it in the actual work you're doing or whether that writing a little demo, writing something to confirm what you, what you know. And that repeats on and on, hopefully forever and ever as you keep going and learning because we're always learning and growing. Okay, so we've covered individual insights and now we're looking at context uh, for an organization. <clears throat> so several challenges of an organization are universal. Knowledge silos, how do you break them down? Redundant work, right? Uh, redundant work goes against everything we as technologists and engineers believe in. We want things to be as efficient as possible. Uh, productivity, how do we get out of our engineers, developers, technologists, whatever you want to call them, how do we get out of their way? How do they spend less time troubleshooting tools and the pieces and parts and more time in that heads down flow state? Growth opportunities, right? We know that we need to provide opportunities to not only learn, but then to leverage those new skills and have new challenges, otherwise people will leave. And distributed teams. And what all of these have in common is they are inherently people challenges. I know if there was just one tool that you could buy and throw out there into, into the workforce, and solve it, we'd all done it. We wouldn't still be talking about these problems over and over again. So they require people and process and best practices to solve as well. So knowledge silos, what do we know about this? Well, we know that not only does it a drain on morale, it slows us down, but it also creates risk for your team or for your business. 68% of developers say they encounter an knowledge silo at least once a week. But what's really interesting is from a Gartner study, 44% of users say they occasionally or frequently made a wrong decision because they didn't have the information they need. That's a lot, right? There are, <laughs> not often do we say we made a bad decision. <laughs> so that's a, that's a pretty high standard for somebody to admit they made a bad decision. So redundancy in work. So 49% of developers say they report answering questions they've answered before. As engineers, we love answering new questions, right? It makes us think, it makes us, our brains work in new ways, but there's nothing worse than feeling like you're a recording, giving the same response, you know, over and over again. But it's also a problem for organizations. And that's why the inner source model is happening. So many organizations have started to adopt the inner source model because they know that multiple teams within their company are building the same components. They're solving the same problem. And not only is it reduce your, your productivity, but it also creates risk in that there's just more surface area for functional bugs or security bugs to be introduced across all of your products. <clears throat> productivity. So not only do the developers tell us that productivity contributes to happiness at work, which I can't believe it was only 50%, because we all know if you don't feel product productive, even when you deliver something, it cuts away at the satisfaction if it felt like it was harder than it needed to be or it took longer than it needed to be, right? By, uh, from a Gartner report, by 2025, 75% of organizations with platform teams and in this case, I think with platform teams, we mean centralized, the teams that are building the reusable pieces to be leveraged across an organization, 
will provide self-server developer portals. They're focusing on developer experience and eventually accelerating innovation. So how do we retain talent? Well, again, 50% of developers want opportunities to learn at work. And if they're not giving to them, they will eventually leave and go somewhere else, right? An interesting uh, report said that a human-centric work focus, which really means putting the employee at the center, as Prashant said earlier, focusing on your people first, who will then take care of your users and your customers, um, increases intent to stay by 48% and overall performance by 28%. I don't know too many technology leaders that would would turn down almost a 50% increase in retention and a quarter percent increase in performance. I don't know too many people that would say, yeah, I'm good. So about 12 years ago, sorry, 10 years ago, next month, Spotify released publicly their scaling agile uh, with talking about tribes, squads, chapters, and guilds, right? Um, about how they organize their people and the work that they do. Uh, I'm pretty sure that almost everyone has either read this original document, it's still out there if you want to go read it, or they've read many of the articles, blog posts, or whatnot of companies talking about how, how and why they adopted it and what worked, what didn't work with them. So 10 years later, the most widely adopted of the four organizational models is guilds. Right? And why is that? Well, it's because organizations have the same challenges, right? As they grow, as they scale, as they evolve. And when you think about guilds, pre-Spotify, guilds in like the original, you know, 18th century, it was really about two things. It was about apprenticeship, learning, and it was about adopting new best practices as a domain matured and evolved. Sound familiar? Sound like the things we're trying to do in technology every day, right? Um, and so I think it's really interesting to look at this phenomenon. So we know that an organization's success depends on focusing on some of these key areas. Reducing the knowledge silos, right? Limiting duplication of effort to drag down velocity and create risk. Investing in that developer experience to improve productivity. Creating space and providing the resources for learning and growth. It's important that you have both. Just one of those doesn't tick the box. You have to have both. And really all of these are about retaining technical talent. And of course, evolving collaborations with new practices and tooling as organizations grow and distribute. So where do we go from here? We've learned a lot, the world has changed a lot, and, um, and we really need to think about how do we widen from this collective knowledge that we built with the original goal and go forward. Well, an interesting thing happened. Prashant talked about this earlier. We got recognized earlier this year in the hype cycle for Agile and DevOps for communities of practice. But this is great. Prashant's excited, everybody's excited. But the most excited part for me was actually getting a framework. Anybody who knows me knows there's nothing I love than a good framework that I can adopt and tweak and apply. And this framework of looking at practice and community and domain on how do we build something amazing. And I think what's really interesting is at the center, if you get all three of them right, you end up with this outcome focused, right? And you can call it a community of practice or you can call it a guild, thanks to Spotify getting that adopted out there as being an open community. And I think this has given us a framework to really evaluate how are we doing? Where can we do more and help us aggregate a whole bunch of learning and a whole bunch of ideas into a really solid approach for the future? Also, the community is telling us where there's opportunities, right? 86% of us already think of us as a resource for learning, right? 
Okay, so we thought of ourselves as a library, and I guess libraries are used for learning, so that makes sense. But what's really interesting is of those surveyed in that developer survey, 58 don't consider themselves a part of the Stack Overflow community. And, those, and a majority of those users were actually registered users, not our anonymous users. So it tells us there's a huge opportunity to make people feel more of a part of a community. 76% of visitors on public Stack Overflow visit one question per session. And that's great. We want to be absolutely as sufficient as possible. We don't want people to have to get distracted or get out of the flow state, right? But what we also learned from our research is that 77% use multiple resources to solve their problem. So we know that even though they may visit one and be done with Stack Overflow, they're probably combining it with content and information elsewhere. So we also think we can do more. And lastly, even with Stack Overflow and all of the questions that Prashant talked about and all of the reuse that we've had, we're still spending more than 30 minutes a day searching for information, not reading it, searching for it. That's inefficiency, right? So the answer is we've done pretty good, but we can do more. So I use these three circles to try and evaluate how are we doing? That's the first thing you do is start with the framework and say, where are we today? And here's what I, you know, and so the size of the circle is sort of how well I think we're doing. Community, then domain, and then practice. But we have an opportunity to deliver more impact. Within the community, we can expand and have more community roles instead of the narrow, specific ones we have today that'll help strengthen that feeling of belonging and finding more ways for people to feel like they can contribute, participate, and engage. Domain. So here's a funny thing. We have sites, which often can be too big. Stack Overflow is probably the worst example of that. No wonder you don't feel a part of Stack Overflow community. There's, a, there's tens of millions of people on there, right? Um, even on our large Teams customers, they can have, as Prashant said, up to 100,000 technologists or employees on there. How do you feel like a part of a community at that size? We've done tags before, but tags are a little too narrow, right? And so we really think this idea of domains that really give this shared purpose and identity where someone can say, yes, I belong to that domain, or yes, this piece of knowledge is relevant to this domain in a much clearer way. And we can broaden the types of content. We know that people are piecing together lots of other types of content, and we think that we can find ways to introduce this content to help put together as much as we can to get you as much information as you can in one place to get you moving forward as fast and on to your next challenge. So here's our new direction. We want to evolve our platform to empower technical communities to learn, share, and grow together. We believe we have clear outcomes. Our outcomes are not just a library but it's actually the community of people writing, consuming, curating, recommending, bringing in outside pieces of content all together that will create a thriving community. And why this is so important is the more a community is thriving and engaging, the more valuable that community is to each person who participates in it. We wanna have more types of contributions. We know that there are people who are creators who are better at curating, people who are builders, and people who are maintainers. And we wanna create space for all of those people to participate, contribute, and receive value from these communities. We want our users to not think of themselves and for us to not think of them as consumers, but to think of themselves as learners, because we're all learners. Every day, we're learning constantly. <clears throat> And we, um, we want to have new interaction models. 
we want to create organic connection. So we're not trying to force chat. We're not trying to force any of this. But there is a real need for people to find each other, to build cohorts. The internet is a big, lonely place, folks. And, you know, as we find more and more people that are learning things at home, learning things on their own, finding cohorts, whether that's synchronously or asynchronously, in order to support each other and to test what they're doing. And last but not least, we want to allow new types of content, allowing the community to share and curate other useful content types. So how do we achieve all of this, right? Well, first, we want to bring in recommended outside content into the platform for feedback. Not everything has to be originated on Stack Overflow or Stack Overflow for Teams. There's lots of great third-party content out there, and what's going to be valuable is the community curating it and giving feedback on it um, so they can share it with others. So not only is the content important, what we learned is that the learning journey is important. Here's how I got from A to Z, right? And maybe when I, I'm a big traveler, so I share my itineraries that I go on my trips far and wide, so other people aren't like, I want to go you know, to Paris, what do I do once I get there? Well, here's an example of what I did, which means you're not staring at a blank page. You can take my itinerary, you can take my learning journey and figure out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And it gets you started a whole lot faster. Focus connected communities, right? We want to enable, like we said, to build communities, to build connections and cohorts, allowing for people who want to engage, to find each other, and to support each other along the journey. We want to have an opportunity for hands-on learning, identifying and hosting asynchronous synchronous opportunities for folks to build and test their new skills, and whether that be alone or together. And the platform for technical knowledge creators we want to think about the potential for new sites within the Stack Exchange ecosystem, backed by a real CMS to enable more subjective. We're very good at objective. We don't want to go to full-on, you know, opinion articles. But there's a lot of blogs, and people get a lot of value out of how I did this and how I did that. And so, how can we enable this within our ecosystem without disrupting SO, but allowing the organization discovery and consumption to be integrated into our larger ecosystem. So how are we going to deliver this? Well, some of it you've already probably seen with collectives on Stack Overflow. We're in beta with a small number of customers and, and domains right now, really focusing on vendor ecosystems and capabilities. And what we've learned that is so amazing is people completely self-select to be a member, right? It's open to anybody. You just have to register and join, and people decide whether they want to join or not. But what we saw consistently across our collectives was that users, after they had self-selected into membership, sorry, um, uh, had a 30% increase in engagement. That was it. Just by the fact that they decided to join that community, they felt a deeper sense of identity and a sense of responsibility and ownership, both to the other individuals in their community, but also to, to creating and curating the knowledge for all of their peers out there. We believe this virtuous cycle that comes from what we, there's a great, I think, ACM study that actually shows that Jody was kind enough to send to me that shows that as engagement increases, people get more value. And if they get more value, then their engagement increases. And then they get more value. And so we really believe that we can help create this virtuous cycle if we focus on the right domains of the right scope and scale. And what we think is so important is if we can create that virtuous cycle, get more engagement and get people learning faster and feeling more capable of learning, that they will um, be able to not only meet the demands of the technology industry has, but also their own professional ambitions. So next, we're talking about hands-on learning. 
right? We're talking about bringing together internal and external content to give people a way to understand a new concept and then test their knowledge through hands-on learning. And we're not building these learning journeys ourselves, right? Or these challenges. As with knowledge, we believe community sourced is king. And here's a mock-up of what we think that might look like. And we haven't forgotten about teams. We're bringing this concept into Stack Overflow for teams, right? Whether you call it a guild or a chapter or a community of practice, and you're super creative and you made up a whole new word for this, uh, like we did on collectives on, uh, out on our public site, we're creating a home for communities within a technology organization to bring together people and knowledge around a specific domain or topic. And here's a mock-up of what we're, we're building. And finally, we're talking about bringing outside content into Stack Overflow for Teams so you can curate it within your organization because we know all the answers and all the information doesn't lie in Stack Overflow for Teams as much as we would like it to, right? And we're starting close to home. So what you're seeing right here is a way to bring a public Stack Overflow question into your team's environment. Your pick, so you don't have to recreate the wheel every time. You can curate public Stack Overflow content. You can add context, which we call the importer notes. We're very clearly showing it's read-only, so you don't accidentally put your institutional knowledge or information out there. But you can get started on curating that content and recommending, saying, this question I bookmarked and I visit every week. I think it's probably going to be useful to my peers. So we think this strategy of combining community, domains, and practice will expand and push the long-held notions of what a distributed community can accomplish. We'll bring together individuals with a common domain to learn and solve problems, focusing on sharing their knowledge, their best practices, their standards, tools, and code. We'll enable members of the monolithic tech community that got Stack Overflow to where it is to self-select if they want to in the many smaller communities, but not disturb the foundation that got us here and that we were building upon. We'll, we'll be able that we believe to blend both what you as individuals, but also what organizations are trying to achieve through a single platform. We believe we'll be able to create new opportunities so more people feel like they contribute as much as they get out of these communities and feel that ownership and that responsibility uh, as well as the value. And we'll elevate passive consumers into active learners. We're really excited about the future and we hope you are too. Thank you. And there was one question that was asked earlier that I was asked to address, so Prashant, uh, Prashant didn't get to it. So uh, let me read the question to you and give you my answer. It says, anonymity is very helpful in the public version. Does lack of anonymity with the Teams version reduce the likelihood to ask questions in Teams? Sometimes it's hard to admit you need help. I get that, believe me. I started as a woman in tech 25 years ago. I know all about this, right? Uh, Prashant mentioned something that we're doing on the public platform to try and be more inclusive called Staging Ground. And, you know, I helped pick this name, so if you like it, you're welcome, and if you don't like it, I'm sorry. But the idea of Staging Ground, the reason I called it that is just like when we're building applications, we put things in a Staging Ground to see how it goes. We don't just go straight from my developer environment right out to production and be like, hope it flies, right? Hope it doesn't take down everything else around it. And so the idea is that it's a psychologically safe place to ask your question, right? And, it's, and one of the big tenets that we're teaching folks is the reason we're trying to coach you to ask a better question is so it can help others because we're all deeply empathetic and we want to help others. And so the idea of like the better question, not only will you get a better answer, but all the people who have this question after you will get 
a great answer and not have to wait and be stuck like you are. And so we'll be rolling that out later this year on public platform in a beta, but we're already having conversations about how we could do that in teams for the same reason, right? Maybe on a small team, it's okay. Maybe if you're junior, it doesn't matter if you're asking 10 people or 100 or 1,000, you, you don't want to say you need help. Um, but I think that having the idea of the staging ground where people are helping you, I think the other thing I would say here is that, you know, the more experienced you are, like I said, I've been in tech for 25 years, right? And I would say the more I've been in tech, the more I know, I don't know just about anything. I'm always learning. And so I think if you can get people to think about the reason to ask the question is not because you need help, but it's really about creating value for all of the people who are around you and all the people who come after you. Maybe you can get out of your own way a little bit and recognize that the value you're creating by asking that question. Thank you. Thank you.